All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. My name is Leanne. I'm the Education Services Manager here for the museum. Uh, it's nice to see some old faces, nice to see some new faces. So welcome to those that are, this is your first time here. Uh, tonight is my uh, job and duty and uh, pleasure to welcome Clayton Ruminski. Uh, he is a managing archivist at Hagley Museum and Library in Delaware, uh, Wilmington, Delaware. If you have not been there yet, please go visit. It is a wonderful visit, uh, and you get to learn all about the gunpowder works, uh, where DuPont started before uh, they got into uh, health and, and things like that. Uh, Clayton has spent nearly 10 years of researching uh, the American iron and steel industry, uh, specifically how small companies uh, reacted when larger companies were formed due to technological uh, and economic changes uh, when U.S. Steel and Bethlehem Steel were, were both formed. Uh, tonight he is going to give you an example of that and with Youngstown, uh, and it's based off of his book that was published in 2017, uh, and his book is available for purchase tonight. Uh, so please join me in welcoming uh, Clayton, Clayton Ruminski. Right. Well, thank you everybody for coming tonight. Um, if, you, if you can't hear me, just let me know and I'll, I'll try to speak up. So, as th thank you, Leanne, for the introduction, and I want to th also thank Gene DiOrio, who is not here tonight, but he initially invited me out to do a uh, presentation at the museum tonight. So I want to—he's th he's been a big help to me. Um, if you don't know Gene, he's a wonderful guy. So I want to thank him. So tonight, I wanted to talk to you about the Youngstown, Ohio region. How about, does, does anybody know much about the Youngstown, Ohio region and what it's known for? Um, so Youngstown is, it was a major steel center in the 19th century and into the 20th century. Primarily the 20th century is when it became one of the, the largest steel manufacturing regions in the country and the world. There were three major steel companies that had several plants in, the Youngstown, in Youngstown proper, let alone the entire Mahoning Valley region. Hey, Gene. <laughs> Speak of the devil. <laughs> I was just talking about you. <laughs> Were you? Yeah, well, I was. Were your ears burning? Hello. Hello. Sorry, a bit late. Oh, no worries. Just got just got started. So as I was saying, there was three major steel companies that were present in the Youngstown, Ohio region. And those included Youngstown Sheet and Tube, which famously tried to merge with Bethlehem Steel in the early 20th century, but ultimately failed because of stockholder concerns. Um, there was also Republic Steel Corporation, and there was also the United States Steel Corporation. Now, what my book delves into is these smaller iron companies that formed in the 19th century and tried to adapt to certain economic changes and technological changes that were provoked uh, at the turn of the 20th century when, amid the formation of United States Steel Corporation and many of the major companies such as Bethlehem Steel, uh, U.S. Steel, and several other merger, uh, mergers that came forth at the 20th, turn of the 20th century in order to consolidate the, the steel industry and the iron industry. So what are these little guys doing? How did they adapt? And what was the outcome? Now, the interesting thing about Youngstown is that it did not start actually producing steel until 1895. It was very late compared to Bethlehem, uh, Cambria, uh, Pittsburgh, Cleveland, Chicago, all the major manufacturing centers. So, for example, uh, uh, Bethlehem didn't start producing until 1872. Uh, the, the Pittsburgh and the Edgar Thompson Works, which is actually still there in Braddock, outside of Pittsburgh, they started producing steel in 1875. Cleveland started producing steel in 1868, and so on. Youngstown didn't start producing until 20 years after Pittsburgh. However, Youngstown did was able to generate uh, several steel uh, companies in the turn of the 20th century and became, uh, went on to become one of the largest steel producing centers in the world. And actually outproduced uh, uh, Youngstown, or uh, the Allegheny County and P uh, Pittsburgh region in 1928. That's a little known fact. So 
I, in my book, I looked at three different questions. So how did Youngstown area iron manufacturers stay competitive in evolving markets? So and as a result of that, how did they cope with technological change that paralleled the great market growth in the late 19th century? And why did they choose to maintain iron production over investing in steel? Like I said, when other major steel manufacturers throughout the country were choosing to produce steel on a larger scale, on a general, generally larger economic scale, Youngstown continued to be an iron producer. So that was my big question in looking into all of this. Why? And how did it affect them? And how didn't it affect them? And what were the major outcomes of that? So the first thing I wanted to show you is just a general map of the region. If you're not familiar with Youngstown sits and the whole context of the region, this is an 1860 map showing the railroads throughout the Mid-Atlantic and the, the Midwest portion here. So Youngstown's right in here. So it's immediately it's exactly halfway between Pittsburgh and halfway between Cleveland. So you have Coatesville down here, and Bethlehem up here, and Cambria and Johnstown in the middle, or the Cambria Steelworks in the middle. So it was right in that middle point um, between the developing manufacturing cities of, of Pittsburgh and Cleveland, and it kind of struggled because of that. It, it didn't grow as, as fast and as quickly as Cleveland and Pittsburgh because Cleveland was a major port city, whereas Pittsburgh was, you know, started early as a major iron manufacturing center. Cleveland, or Youngstown really didn't know how to generate economic growth in the early 19th century. And it was kind of looking uh, for an outlet for its economic growth. So what happened was that Youngstown eventually found that they had a generous portion of raw materials in the area. Now, that really set it aside from a lot of manufacturing areas uh, throughout the country. So here's a kind of a, cl a close-up view of the Mahoning Valley. So the general 20-mile stretch along the Mahoning River is known as the Mahoning Valley. Youngstown sits right in the center, and we have uh, the small town of Lowville at the very southeastern portion, and more in Ohio, we're up in the uh, south, uh, northwest. Through that entire stretch, by the early 20th century, it was entirely lined with steel plants or uh, related industries. This is an early map showing the location of small iron furnaces in the region. So I'd say this is about 1830 to 1850. There was quite literally only one, two, three, four small iron furnaces that didn't last more than 15 to 20 years. That was, that was base, the basic economy of Youngstown region. <coughs> Where unlike Pittsburgh, who started to manufacture iron on a, on a larger scale at this point, and Cleveland, who had developed itself as a major port city, Youngstown was struggling, as you can see. And a lot of these were early charcoal furnaces, and I'll get into the, the fuels used and why those were important, uh, which charcoal furnaces had a short uh, lifespan uh, because of raw materials needed. They needed trees and lots of them <coughs> to produce charcoal, so they had a short lifespan, and they just lasted between 15 and 20 years of the, the longest. So here's my pigs. So I wanted to... <laughs> I always like showing this because it gets you, gives you an idea of what, what the Youngstown area produced, what were the primary materials produced in the iron and steel industry, and why it was important. This, this plays into a lot of my study in my book, and, and pig iron is the most important product of the Youngstown region. So pig iron is the base product of the iron and steel industry. It's made in the blast furnace. It's it's used mainly as is cast in the foundry, so it's used in foundries or converted into wrought iron or steel. The, the trait of pig iron is usually two, two to five percent. That's, that's, that's the key number. So it's a little bit higher in carbon content, which makes it a lot more brittle. So you can't really use it to build structures, buildings, anything like that. It'll, it'll just break in half, basically. If it's too much weight, too much pressure, it'll shatter. So uh, the only real use for uh, pig iron straight from the blast furnace was for foundry work and for castings. So wrought iron is the product of manipulating pig iron. So essentially it was highly ductile and it's withstood corrosion, high tensile strength. So this was produced in a puddling furnace and I'll show you each process just to get an idea of how it was made and what they look like because I'm a very visual person and it it's very hard to visualize these, these processes if you're not familiar with them. 
The puddling furnace was small scale production, extremely labor intensive. It was, it was uh, uh, worked by a guy named a puddler and puddler's assistant. It usually took about two to five years apprenticeship to learn the trade. It was very skilled trade and they were among the highest paid workers in the, the iron mills because of that. So basically they had to work about a ton of pig iron into a low carbon content, half molten blob. <laughs> That's the best way to put it. So it had a low carbon content, which means it was ductile and it was, it was very strong. So a lot of that was used in iron gates, you know, any structural iron work and that kind of thing. Because it, was, it did not shatter like pig iron did. So steel is kind of, the best way I like to talk, uh, you know, to uh, discuss steel is that it's a, it includes the qualities of pig iron and wrought iron. So it's very strong and it can be manipulated and worked. So that was actually made in the Bessemer converter on a large scale and in the open hearth furnace, which of course Lukens have produced open hearth steel here and they did not have a Bessemer converter, am I correct? Correct. No, correct. correct. So they only produce for open hearth steel here and the qualities of, of the Bessemer steel and open hearth steel was that they could be produced on industrial scale unlike wrought iron. So for example, with wrought iron, a labor intensive process, you have one person and, or two people, the puddler and puddler's assistant, making one ton of, of wrought iron in about an hour. Whereas you can make 10 tons of steel in 20 minutes using the Bessemer converter. Now the quality, the, uh, the quality of steel, usually about less than 1.5% carbon, and that's what makes it extremely strong, extremely ductile. And the reason the pigs were on there, I wanted to show you why it was called pig iron, if, you, if you're not familiar with the term. This is actually a casting pig iron in a blast furnace. So if you look at the, the rows of pig iron, it looks like baby pigs suckling on the mother's, um, suckling, uh, suckling pigs, essentially. So that, that's where they got, because a lot of early iron manufacturers were from agricultural roots. So this is what they saw when they made pig iron. So these photographs show a blast furnace in Sharpsville, Pennsylvania, which is about, about an hour outside of Pittsburgh, just across the Ohio, uh, Ohio border. And this is, uh, this is the Bessemer converter. This is, uh, shows one in Youngstown, Ohio, the Republic Steel Corporation, about 1940, which is actually very late to continue Bessemer uh, steel production. At that time, open hearth mainly would take precedent, <coughs> which is another issue with Youngstown. But we'll get to that in a minute. So this, this is the, and you can see the platform right up here and see how large it was. This is about, there's nobody in this photograph, but you can see how large the uh, Bessemer converter is. That's about a 15 ton converter. So that's producing about 15 tons of steel within 20 minutes. This is the, raw, this is the process of making wrought iron very labor intensive. This is the puddler and this is his method of manipulating pig iron in the puddling furnace. Now that weighed about a ton, so you have to be extremely strong. And these tongs were suspended from the <coughs> ceiling so they could you know, have more ease of movement. And once you are complete manipulating the pig iron to wrought iron, essentially you had to go to a roll. Basically, if you look at the hot strip mill or the, in modern steel making, this was a very small scale manual version of that. Essentially, you had to roll the iron into shapes, and then you put it on uh, special rolls to make rails, bar, anything like that. A very labor intensive process. And a lot of puddling and wrought iron making was basically discontinued in the early 20th century when steel took precedent over um, as, as the primary metal used in uh, iron and steel making. There were some manufacturers that continued into the 70s over in Britain, but that was only for specialty purposes, uh, if anybody needed wrought iron structures or anything like that. So to give you a context of, what, uh, of, of Youngstown and the Mahoning Valley region, so by 1850, you have Eastern Pennsylvania making pig iron through the anthracite process. Uh, so they used anthracite coal, which is in the no uh, northeast uh, region of Pennsylvania, up in the Carbon County, Lehigh Valley area. Central Pennsylvania was largely making pig iron with charcoal. Pittsburgh, they did not make any pig iron, so they only made wrought, wrought iron and finished iron. They bought their <coughs> pig iron from different sources, particularly Youngstown and 
middle Pennsylvania, central Pennsylvania, and they was actually exported into the Pittsburgh region. Cleveland, they were primarily shipping. They didn't have much manufacturing at the time. They did not develop an iron and steel industry until about the Civil War. Southern Ohio, pig iron, uh, made with charcoal, that was their primary industry. Youngstown, the Mahoning Valley, they primarily made pig iron as well to export to uh, the young, uh, Pittsburgh region. Now, you'll notice that pig iron made in eastern Pennsylvania was made with anthracite, pig iron made with charcoal. You notice that Youngstown made pig iron with bituminous coal. Of course, bituminous coal is known to be dirty. <coughs> it had to be coked, which means basically all the impurities were burned out of it to make it pure carbon. And that's how you actually smelted the iron ore. Now, with bituminous coal, it, was, it had a lot of impurities in it, but the bituminous coal within the Mahoning Valley region was uh, actually of a special, very special quality that wasn't found anywhere else in the country. And it was only in small quantities that could be used. Straight from the coal mine and into the blast furnace, it didn't have to go through a secondary middleman process, which made it very unique, and that spurred the industrial economy of Youngstown in the 1840s and 1850s. So at that time, you have the foundation of industrial and market growth in the 1840s by uh, the construction of the Pennsylvania and Ohio Canal. And that was actually, that connected Pittsburgh over to Akron, Ohio, LeBron James, so if anybody's familiar <laughs> with that. And Akron uh, connected up to Cleveland. So he had a port to bring in any raw materials down from uh, Cleveland and over to Youngstown. So there was an efficient transportation method. Coal mining began. So this coal I was talking about, this bituminous coal of special quality. Block coal is what it was called. You know, locals called it block coal because it was mined in blocks. Simple as that. <clears throat> now, it was, a, it was a dry, open burning, high carbon content coal. So it was a natural coke, which means you could just, like again, you could just take it out of the coal mine into the blast furnace. You didn't need to uh, coke the, uh, the impurities out of the coal. Unlike uh, the coal mined in southwestern Pennsylvania and Fayette County and whatnot, that was very famous for uh, uh, supplying Pittsburgh steelworks. So it was used to smell iron ore directly, and that's the key. So what this uh, uh, what happened was it stimulates growth and investment. So you have entrepreneurs coming from Pittsburgh, central Pennsylvania, moving over to Youngstown because of the raw materials available there. So they're beginning to start building these new blast furnaces that are fairly cheap to, to, to use and utilize and to produce pig iron for uh, sale to foundries, to rolling mills in Pittsburgh. So about 1845 is when the first blast furnace is built. Between 1845-1855 there's probably, I think there's about eight furnaces built in the Youngstown area. And they utilize this raw coal. Over here is an image of a charcoal furnace in Youngstown that was converted into raw coal by a Pittsburgh entrepreneur. It failed ultimately, but you can see that, that, that this new method, uh, which was unheard of in many cases uh, throughout the industry, really began in the Youngstown region and really sparked massive growth. So in the 1850s, you have another important event, which is the Lake Superior iron ore trade. So speculators go up to the Lake Superior area, Marquette, Michigan. They find mountains of iron ore, mountains, very high, high value iron ore, very pure iron ore that can be used to smelt into pig iron. Speculators start sending pig iron down on, on boats through the, the Great Lakes, and that first occurs in 1853. So they start shipping on the canal all the way to Youngstown. It's about a 90 mile trip. Well, that's cut in half by the emergence of the Cleveland Mahoning Railroad in 1856, three years later. <clears throat> so the trip for now uh, is about 50 miles from the Cleveland ports down to Youngstown blast furnaces. Pittsburgh's market begins to change at the same time. Many of uh, Pittsburgh, the, the pig iron shipped to Pittsburgh was actually produced by small blast furnaces dotting the Juniata Valley over in central Pennsylvania in the Harrisburg area. Those were shipped a long ways, usually by, by oxen, horseback, not horseback, but by oxen and whatnot. 
So it was expensive. It was expensive to ship the, the material and expense, expensive to produce the wrought iron after conversion. So with the growth of pig iron in the Youngstown region, there was a substantial market niche that was formed for Youngstown iron producers, which means that you had more investment coming into the city in the region from uh, Cleveland investors who wanted to get in on this trade because they also own stakes in the iron ore trade up in Lake Superior in Michigan. You have more investors coming from Young uh, Pittsburgh as well, all descending on Youngstown because of this, this huge, huge uh, and, and, and fruitful uh, raw material trade. And at that same time, it starts to push Youngstown from agricultural to industrial economy. This is an example of an early sketch of, of a blast furnace and rolling mill that was developed on the canal in Youngstown uh, about 1855. So about that time, it would start to be a, a huge industrial transformation in the area. Amidst, you know, on the eve of the Civil War, uh, the Cleveland Leader actually published the Cleveland newspaper, Mahoning Valley is now the most favored place in the Union for the manufacture of iron. And in part, that was true. Uh, it, if you look at the, the, the coal that was available, the iron ore now being able to be shipped easily via railroad down into the region. And they also found local iron ore that was, be, that was able to be used in uh, making iron in the blast furnaces. It was a perfect combination, amalgamation of, of the perfect economy to develop a major industrial region. So the market favorability begins to change. So Pittsburgh, unfortunately, for Youngstown, started to utilize greater transportation networks. So they, as more railroads were built, Pittsburgh started to build their own blast furnaces, particularly the first being among them being the uh, Jones and Laughlin blast furnaces built in 1859, uh, the Eliza furnaces. And so iron mills were starting to produce their own pig iron for their own consumption, which was the problem for the Youngstown market. However, there was still a huge demand from Youngstown iron manufacturers, or from Pittsburgh iron manufacturers, for Youngstown pig iron. So they became reliant. Youngstown became reliant on Pittsburgh consumers, essentially, which is never good to be, have all your eggs placed in one basket, which affected them <laughs> later in the 19th century. So with new technology came greater output for iron manufacturers. However, because Youngstown relied on kind of an unstable market, there was actually slower adaptation on their part, whereas in Young or Pittsburgh, like, places, like companies like Jones and Laughlin, well, they had a constant need for pig iron, so they constantly produced their own and, and converted into wrought iron. At this time, Youngstown did not have many wrought iron producers, so they did not need their own pig iron. So they re completely relied on outside markets, which again was a major problem. It worked great during the Civil War. A lot of the, um, a lot of Youngstown's pig iron was actually sent to the Fort Pitt foundry, made in the cannon and whatnot at that time. But after the Civil War, you started to see incredible growth in the Pittsburgh area, particularly with the emergence of Andrew Carnegie. Um, so in 1872, post-Civil War, you have the start of redevelopment of the region. In the Mahoning Valley, you had about 21 blast furnaces, 219,000 ton capacity. They could produce that in a year, roughly. Pittsburgh, they were catching up. So they, only, they had about half the blast furnaces, but they could also almost produce as much as the Youngstown region in the, in the year. And the reason being is because Andrew Carnegie and major Pittsburgh financiers um, started to adopt technology used in Wales and England because they were leading uh, in, the, in the technological area. And with that new technology, they can produce higher amounts of iron mm. with, with at a lower cost, essentially. So they can reduce the amount of fuel they used and produce more, more iron for their mills down in Pittsburgh. Because Youngstown relied on that market, and it was very unstable. They didn't find the need to invest because, quite frankly, you invest in an unstable market, an uncertain market, there's no need to do that. So Mahoning Valley iron manufacturers were way behind Pittsburgh at this time because Andrew Carnegie and other 
uh, manufacturers in Pittsburgh began to really put money into their mills. <coughs> so because of that, Youngstown iron manufacturers fell dormant, essentially. They just leveled off production. Andrew Carnegie's Lucy Furnace, which is pictured here, which was at that time the largest blast furnace in the world, uh, they, it was built in 1872 along the Allegheny River. So technological innovation spurred an in increase in capacity down there. Andrew Carnegie's rivals built their own blast furnaces across from the Lucy Furnace, and they had a huge competition down there within Pittsburgh itself, which left, which left Youngstown reeling. So Youngstown production leveled off. They did not increase their production, whereas Pittsburgh manufacturers increased every year substantially. So Youngstown had to cater to a new market, and that was Bessemer Steel. So Bessemer Steel first began, you know, large spread production in the United States around 1864. And like I mentioned, Cleveland began production of Bessemer Steel on a large scale in 1868. So there was a, a need for a new market. So with producing pig iron for these processes, there's different grades that you could use that needed to be used for pig iron, Bessemer pig iron, for open hearth pig iron, for open hearth steel, and wrought iron. So different grades needed had different um, for different uh, steel processes. Steel rail production grew tremendously. At this point, iron rails were the primary source uh, of four railroad companies. <clears throat> Bessemer steel proved to be stronger, more durable for heavier loads, train loads. Um, iron rails cracked under pressure, um, whereas Bessemer steel proved to be the stronger metal used for that. So what Andrew Carnegie does in Pittsburgh, he starts to develop his own steelworks. So 1875, he puts the Edgar Thompson steel plant in production, making Bessemer Steel one of the largest steel works in the world at the time. And it was primarily for the production of Bessemer Steel rails. Now, at that point in Youngstown, the cost of producing steel rails outweighed the benefits. Um, no one had enough capital or they didn't want to use the risk of actually producing steel rails on, on a mass scale. So in new construction in other areas of the country required more pig iron, so they kind of sorted the branch out. They wanted to branch out their market, and steel plants generally consumed about 50,000 tons of pig iron a year. So Youngstown Iron Manufacturers were, we have a new market, steel. We'll provide it for the steel market rather than mm -hmm. the iron market. So at that point, you have the Panic of 1873, which really causes a lot of problems, the economic panic. Um, a lot of the mills in Youngstown were shuttered, um, just completely shut down, uh, laid off thousands of workers, bread lines everywhere. However, by the end of the Panic in 1878, you have a lot of reinvestment in the shuttered mills by the Youngstown social elite. So at that point, they began to reevaluate their position in the market. So the pressure of steel, I like to call it, by 1880, Youngstown iron manufacturers were really wondering if they should invest in, actual, in steel making in Youngstown or just continue to cater to the market. So they continued to cater to the market instead of building steelworks. And I, I love this quote I found from the Briar, Briar Hill Iron Company, a local pig iron company at the time. To utilize our plant in making Bessemer metal would involve building steelworks convenient to the blast furnaces. This we decided was unwise to do. That was uh, from 1884. That was not a wise thing to do, uh, to not build steel plants, uh, because at this time, in 1880s, you have Andrew Carnegie down in Pittsburgh integrating their plants with more iron production and steel production, so they, are, they have no need for Youngstown iron at that time. So as you can see, the Bessemer converters just exploded around the country. By 1884, there were 45 Bessemer converters, 1894 to 95 throughout the country. So in 1895, you have about 4.9 million tons of Bessemer still produced in the country. Youngstown still didn't produce any. They were still catering to that market. Um, and at that point, they were losing their market share to integrated steel producers. So the term integrated steel producers basically means that steel, steel companies who produce their own steel also build their own blast furnaces to, to uh, convert into the steel. So they produce their own iron to convert steel, so they didn't need to buy it off the market. That's what that essentially means. Youngstown had none of that. 
So they looked to a new niche, which was foundries and fabrication, because these steel plants were being built, so they needed the structural steel to build it. So they provided pig iron to these, these, uh, these foundries throughout the country during a huge construction boom. However, the production was still dominated by an unstable market, um, which is the general theme of, in Youngstown. This is a, a photo of one of these integrated steel plants. This is the Edgar Thompson Steel Works, uh, built by Andrew Carnegie in 1875. This is about 1888. These show the line of blast furnaces, which were, there was about nine of them at the time. It was a massive plant, one, the largest one in the country, and it's still in operation today, by the way. One of the very few down there. And you can see what Youngstown was operating with. Substantially smaller. This is just an iron plant. It did not produce any steel. It has one blast furnace. And this is, about, this is only a year later after the previous picture was taken. So you can see the size difference and output difference. Uh, this was all just wrought iron. This was no steel production here. And this is what dominated Youngstown. Whereas uh, Pittsburgh had massive plants like the Edgar Thompson plant. So the pressure to produce steel was really on Youngstown iron manufacturers. They continued to lose that market share. Whereas if I looked at the average capitalization of companies in the Youngstown area, it was about $270,000. Pittsburgh, 805000 That does not include Carnegie Steel, which was $25 million. Um, and the largest English steel companies were capitalized about five hundred five to $12 million. So you can see Carnegie Steel in Pittsburgh was really dominating the, the industry at the time. And Youngstown also had a cost disadvantage in producing pig iron. So Youngstown, you could produce it at $4.47 a ton, whereas Cleveland and Pittsburgh are roughly $3.06 a ton. So they had a huge cost disadvantage. Uh, they couldn't outsource their material anymore. They outsourced their product to Pittsburgh or Cleveland because they could produce their own iron. So what do they do? They decide to form steel companies of their own so they can have a local consumption, uh, consume their own pig iron locally. So in 1892, the Shenango Valley Steel Company was formed in Newcastle, Pennsylvania, which is about 45 minutes outside of Pittsburgh. That became a major consumer of Youngstown pig iron. Uh, there, was, there was a consortium of, of iron companies that met in the early 1890s in Youngstown to talk about the idea of forming their own steel company so they can actually provide iron to, to this steel company. Um, it was kind of an inside job. So as a result, the Ohio Steel Company was formed in Youngstown in 1893, the first, and that was during the Panic of 1893, so construction uh, was delayed until uh, for a few years. In 1895, it finally produced its first steel, 20 years after Pittsburgh. It was a huge investment. Um, and it was also a huge investment to modernize these old blast furnaces that provided pig iron to Young's, or, me, Pittsburgh mills. At that point, they began, output-wise, they were on par with large industrial centers like Pittsburgh, like Cleveland, like Bethlehem. However, local consolidation was a failure. They, uh, at one point, Youngstown Iron Manufacturers tried to consolidate all the iron companies into one major company to compete with the likes of Carnegie Steel and all of these massive companies throughout the country, like Bethlehem Iron and whatnot. Uh, so they can compete on a national market, but that ultimately failed. This is an example of one of the, the blast furnaces in Youngstown in 1899. Um, as you can see, it's, this was a manually fed version. Uh, later, later blast furnaces were actually mechanically fed by a ramp up the, up the top of the furnace. This was actually loaded by very large men wheeling about 1,500 pound wheelbarrows full of iron ore, another 1,500 pounds of iron ore, and dumping it into the top of the furnace. Very dangerous job. A lot of deaths occurred. Um, asphyxiation by blast furnace gases coming out of the top, burns, and explosions on the top of the, the furnace. It was a very dangerous, and this was problematic of the situation in Youngstown and the lack of modernization. You know, this was a 19th century technology, and most other companies in Pittsburgh were starting to adopt new technology from English steel companies and you know, uh, English engineers and Welsh engineers. So because of that, this, this new investment in steel in the Youngstown area 
basically resulted in a merger and consolidation. So now the foundation was placed in the 1890s for a major merger movement. So what happens in the 1890s? In the 1880s, you see the Standard Oil uh, Company starting to buy up all the oil companies across the United States. It forms a just absolutely huge monopoly. They basically take their, their, the, their cue from, from uh, Rockefeller. So they start consolidating all of the minor iron, major minor iron steel companies across the country. So it reduces competition. Uh, it reduces fluctuation in the economy. And it normalizes all production. So you can now go to smaller plants, shut them down if they're inefficient, and, and update the modern plants. So merger and consolidation affected the Mahoning Valley in a huge way. In 1899, you have the Republic Iron Steel Company formed in Youngstown and the Carnegie Steel Company, uh, U.S. Steel. Carnegie Stump Steel Company is a subsidiary of U.S. Steel. Uh, formed in, uh, it took over operations in 1901 into 1903. They, put, they just poured a ton of money into these mills to modernize them. So integrated iron mills were consolidated and shut down because the lack of efficiency. Um, the investment in steel just booms. So at that point in the early 20th century, you have you know, huge investment. So you have more modern blast furnaces, old ones torn down, new steel works uh, built at the time. You have, you have about five new steel works built between 1900 and 1912 in the Youngstown area. There were several blast furnace plants that remained independent and tried to compete on the market, and there was a huge need for, for pig iron at the time in the Youngstown area because these integrated steel mills have yet to build their own uh, way, ways and means of actually producing pig iron and new blast furnaces. However, they began to capsize the local market when they started to build their own, their own mills. And this is an example of the Public Iron Steel Company in Youngstown. These are the new Bessemer converters they built in 1900. I think you can see one little worker right there. You can see that. Very hard to see. They're huge. So these were 10 ton. They could produce 10 tons of steel in 20 minutes each. So I wanted to show this transformation from iron into steel production. This, this view shows the Mahoning River in Youngstown, right in downtown Youngstown. This is about 1889. And this shows the Brown Bunnell Iron Company, which at one point was the largest iron company in the, in the country. This was a target for the mergers in the, at the turn of the 20th century. Um, it, it had a good foundation, rail networks. Um, it was primarily consisted of wrought iron, uh, rolling mills, which you can see here in the background. And the next, and within 12 years, it transforms into a major modern steel uh, company with the uh, money invested by Republic Iron and Steel Company. So. I wanted to conclude just with a few remarks. So the Youngstown region was very unique. And if you look at you know, how, the, how Bethlehem developed and how, you know, even say in Coatesville, Lukens is also very unique in that sense. Um, Youngstown relied on a niche market for much of its existence in the, in the, in the iron and steel industry. Where, you know, if you look at Coatesville and Lukens, they relied on a niche market in some way, shape, or form. You know, they relied on plate steel, whereas Youngstown relied on pig iron market. Well, eventually they had to adapt to new economic changes, and it was absolutely necessary to bring them into modernization in the 20th century. So, like I said, uh, by 1928, they outproduced Pittsburgh in steel manufacturing. That's a little known fact. Everybody thinks Pittsburgh was the by far the largest steel producer in the country, but Youngstown did outproduce them at one point. So looking back at the 19th century, for much of, the, for much of those years, they did, Youngstown did not require top technological efficiency due to this diverse and unstable market that they had um, relied upon. Whereas when you start to build your own mills and invest with, internally within your own mills, you don't need to rely on that market anymore. And that's what drove them to invest in the 20th century. Um, but it did held, hold that niche in the market until driven on to the financial brink in the 1890s. Um, it forced them to invest in steel production. 
So it was basically at a desperate and extreme industrial transformation, unlike many of the other major iron and steel centers in the, in the country. And I think Youngstown proves a very interesting case study on how the small guys adapted to these economic changes and how they adapted to J.P. Morgan's U.S. Steel Company and any of the ma other major uh, companies that formed in the 20th century and dominated the country in the iron and steel industry. So I think that's all I have for you. <laughs> any, any, any questions? I have a question. It's okay. a little different subject, but yeah. can you tell us a little bit more about Hagley, how you operate, and what your collection consists sure. of? Down here? So, so a little bit background, why I was I, I came here. So I'm from the Youngstown, Ohio area, of course, and I came here about early in 2016. I moved to Delaware, particularly for Hagley, for the job, mainly because of my studies in the iron and steel industry, the 19th century business history and whatnot. Um, so my job as an archivist there is to manage the collections we have. We have about 42,000 boxes of material, um, which amounts to about eight to nine miles of paper there. So there's a large collection. We have the entire Lucan steel collection, which amounts to well over a thousand boxes, I believe. It just, it's one of our larger collections. We have the Pennsylvania Railroad, collection, which is over 2,000 boxes. Uh, we have the Reading Company, Reading Railroad as well. And we have a lot of Phoenix Steel records as, and Bethlehem Steel records as well. <clears throat> so my job is to basically to maintain these collections and make sure they're accessible to, to the researchers, to the public, anybody who wants to see them. Um, and by doing that, we put our collections online that we can search. You can search for them. Not, they're not all digitized. They're not all digitized. That's an impossible task. It'll take 100 years. Um, but you can search for certain subjects that we have, certain collections that we have. If ever you want to come down to, to do research in the, in the archives, you're free to do so. These collections are open, and we encourage people to come down. Um, some very interesting stuff. We have records of over 1,000 uh, businesses, corporations, and trade uh, organizations there as well. So, particularly U.S. Chamber of Commerce, National Association of Manufacturers, and so on. Avon. <laughs> so, we have quite a bit. A lot of local manufacturers, 19th century, from Wilmington, Delaware County, Chester County, as well. So, I assume you have a lot of uh, DuPont. What about General Motors? Not much General Motors, no. Of course, uh, we have, we have was president of General Motors when he was president um, of DuPont. Right. Um, there's, there, there's material within collections. There, we don't have a General Motors collection at, in and of itself. Um, you know, with the John J. Raskob, we have John J. Raskob's papers. You know, he was involved with General Motors as well. So there's a lot of material within papers that talks about different internal structures within General Motors, but nothing. We might have some pamphlets and catalogs, but that's about it, unfortunately. Not sure who has the stuff, if it's anywhere, to be honest. I think General Motors may have they, it. They may still have it. Like, it's kind of like U.S. Steel. They still have all their stuff. Um, nobody can get in there. It's under lock and key, essentially. I, I heard recently that they have, General Motors has a, a huge storage area where they've stored at least one of every vehicle they've made. And car collectors, <laughs> if you're mm -hmm. right. really high up in the uh, th that business of car collecting, you might be able to get in to see it. See, that wouldn't fit in our storage space. <laughs> <laughs> we're already lacking, we're lacking space already. That's, a, that's an issue with our guys, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Was Republic Steel a result of merger of the, uh, some of the big iron producers that they just combined yes. to create Republic? Republic was primarily all um, independent, uh, mostly, mostly wrought iron producers, rolling mills mm -hmm. in, the, in, the, in the Youngstown region. Uh, and they kind of bought up all of the independent blast furnace companies and the rolling mills uh, in order to provide, um, in order to build a new steel plant in 1900. <laughs> so basically all of the other mills, <coughs> they needed those blast furnaces until they could build their own blast furnaces. They eventually just tore them all down because they didn't need them anymore. Uh, so they needed to modernize. They, they, basically they needed to start somewhere and that was a good start until they built their new modern <coughs> plants. And all that, so. Their own integrated plant. Yes. Plant. Yep. Yeah. Until they could build their own integrated plant along the mm -hmm. river, they used all the little 
independent blast furnaces to provide their own uh, pig iron and whatnot. Did that capital come out of the Youngstown area? Yes. Yeah, it was originally, head, uh, Rub Public was originally headquartered in Youngstown. Mm -hmm. I believe it moved to Pittsburgh uh, <coughs> later in the 20s, uh, and then up the Cleveland. <coughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Um, question about your cost per ton. Uh, chart where you had Cleveland and Pittsburgh, yeah. uh, 306 per yeah, ton. Yeah, right, right. And you've got uh, Youngstown, uh, you know, north of four. Right. Just, you know, mostly due to technological scale yeah. or any other, you know, significant uh, factors? Acquisi acquisition of raw materials. Quite frankly, Youngstown was right in the middle of Pittsburgh and Cleveland. So Pittsburgh had the benefit of having the bituminous coal fields down in Fayette County right now, right there within, you know, probably 50 miles. So they had large rail networks that just easily brought them up. And of course, Henry, Henry Clay Frick was involved with, the, you know, they owned most of the coking lands down there. So they had, they got some good contracts. You know, um, he was invested in most of the railways, so he had some, he, they made some good contracts with the steel companies. Um, whereas in Cleveland, they could produce it on a much cheaper scale because they, they didn't have, they cut out uh, rail transportation. It came right off the docks, essentially. So Youngstown was kind of in the middle, which gave them a kind of a big disadvantage at that point. So that's, that's, the, that's the big discrepancy. Are there any producers still alive in the valley? No. The last one uh, was shut down in 2012. Um, that was from RG Steel Company, which also owned the Sparrows Point plant down in Maryland, which was recently torn down. Um, they fell into bankruptcy. They owned the last plant in the Youngstown area as well. I was able to tour that plant and see the blast furnace production and everything, the basic, basic um, and the uh, hot strip mill before month before they closed so I was able to get some photographs and whatnot but that was the last of its and it was recently torn down last year so there's nothing left. Have you been to their museum? Youngstown has a steel museum right? I worked there for quite a while. Yeah, great. Yeah. Yeah, I was in the archives up there yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's where I started basically that's, great. that's where I got into this um, you know they had a, they have all the Youngstown sheet and tube material most of the Republic steel materials up in uh, the Western Reserve Historical Society in Cleveland because they were headquartered up there for most of their lifespan. So. Any other questions? Yes. I was born in Warren. My father yep. worked at, uh, in Copperweld. Yep. I had the impression they might still be doing something up there. there there's so something there. there. Um, I was just I was just back in Ohio in you know, a couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. when we drove right past the Copperweld plant, mm -hmm. the former Copperweld plant. Um, there's still something going on there. I know they've been, sh you know, shutting down production and going back into production. I don't know exactly what's going on. Mm -hmm. It's uh, very in and out. But um, well, so the area you're speaking of is the Youngstown piece of that Mahoney. Uh, mm -hmm. that's well, I, this, the, all of this is included in, in Warren as well. Warren wasn't very much of a manufacturer until the you know 20th century. They mm -hmm. didn't because they didn't have the the coal. Right. The coal the coal mines basically stopped before it reached Warren. Um, but I thought you mentioned earlier in your talk that Youngstown mm -hmm. had raw materials nearby. Oh, they did, yes. Was, was it iron ore that was nearby? They had uh, local iron ore, and they had um, bituminous coal mines. Uh, and there's also plenty of limestone that was there as well. They continued to mine, use limestone up until the 1970s, actually. There's plenty of that. But they mined out there at coal, and they had to actually get coal from uh, south of Pittsburgh and Fayette County and whatnot. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so that's when they were at a competitive disadvantage. Yes, yes. Yeah, once they mined out all their local coal, basically, that's where they had to reach out to other sources. It drove up the costs. Yeah. But yeah, Warren, Warren is actually, that was the plant that recently shut down was in Warren. Oh. Um, yeah, so that's the one I was able to tour. It's sad, but. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Glad to answer. Good. Was I on time? Enjoyable.